Good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday. We have an amazing show for everybody today. What do we have, Crystal? Indeed, we do. Lots of election news, lots of legal news, lots of 2024 news. Um, first of all, I'm sure you guys saw us our dueling speeches in Pennsylvania over the past several days with President Biden and former President Trump, both the Kick off to the, uh, like, launch to the midterms, the final stretch here, but also kind of the unofficial kickoff for 2024. So we'll start with that. We've also got some legal updates. The judge sided with the Trump team uh, is saying, yes, let's go forward with a special master. We'll break down what that means. Uh, definitely a setback for the government. How much of a setback for the government? Uh, unclear. So we'll dig into all of that. Also, there's been a big question about what the hell is going on over at the National Republican Senatorial Committee with their money in particular. Rick Scott is heading up that outfit. First of all, it's become very clear that a lot of people completely hate Rick Scott because they are leaking to the press on him like crazy. There is also a feud between him and McConnell, but we have some new details about how exactly they spent all of that money and put themselves in a very difficult position down the stretch here. Um, we have a new prime minister of uh, the UK. We will tell you about her and what it might mean for our war with Russia in Ukraine. Um, we also have an update out of California that is actually potentially very positive. Last week, I told you about how they were considering uh, something called sectoral bargaining for the fast food sector, where basically all workers at fast food restaurants, large chains would be able to be subject to the same conditions negotiated at the statewide level. So everybody's wages would be lifted. Theoretically, um, that is going through. So could have major implications there and around the country. We have Jordan Cheriton. His team has been on the ground in Jackson, Mississippi, where they have been without water. So we've got an update for you there. With all of that out of the way, let's get to these two dueling speeches from current President Biden and former President Trump. Um, we'll start with Biden. So they really sort of built up to this speech as this is going to be, you know, a big discussion about the future of the country and the threats to democracy, et cetera. Um, they did this in Philadelphia. Uh, we'll get to this in a minute. The staging of it was quite dramatic, let's say. Um, here's a little taste of what the president had to say. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. But there's no question that the Republican Party today is dominated, driven, and intimidated by Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans. And that is a threat to this country. MAGA forces are determined to take this country backwards, backwards to an America where there is no right to choose, no right to privacy, no right to contraception, no right to marry who you love. They promote authoritarian leaders and they fan the flames of political violence that are a threat to our personal rights, to the pursuit of justice, to the rule of law, to the very soul of this country. Throwback to 2020 campaign. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So I got kind of excited when I uh. saw the commentary about this speech because yes. I didn't watch it in real time. I watched it after the fact. And I saw the visuals, which let's go ahead and throw the picture up on the screen. A lot of people like yes, really the honestly famous, the famous photo melting down over this photo um, because, of course, the real threat to democracy is red LED lights. There was a, a whole discussion about the optics. And I got excited when I was like, oh, my God, he's like embracing dark Brandon. And yeah. I do think that's kind of what they were trying to channel, right? Yeah. I think that was kind of intentional. So, and then there was a whole freak out about the content of the speech. So I was like, oh, maybe this is like mm -hmm. really something. And then I listened to it and I was like, this sounds like the same thing that I've heard for four years. I mean, it's it's fine. I don't have an issue with it. I just, there was a, a major meltdown over the speech, over the optics around it, over the whole thing. And I was like, my problem with it is just sort of like, not actually that powerful of a speech and just similar banal language that we've heard for Democrats for years. This now. is just the clear banality of I mean, listen, what the this as we I think our we did this in our last show on Thursday, this is the correct strategy if you're Joe Biden. You do not want to run on the economy. You do not want to run on inflation to the extent that you've had limited political success, you know, the Chips Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, all of those other things, as we've all said, that's very likely not to move the needle. What moves the needle? It's getting people to come out and vote against something. And by getting people to come out and vote against Trump, that's how he got elected to the Oval Office. So he is returning right back to that frame. We've got Trump at the top of mind. We're going to be talking about Trump here in the show. Trump himself, very happy to embrace this because it helps solidify his hold over the Republican Party. And Ben Shapiro's analysis, I think that we brought everybody last Tuesday, is eminently correct, which is that the more that you make this about personalities and about these two dueling uh, figures rather than yeah. any underlying social force of which people 
people originally were coming to vote out against as Republicans. This is exactly what any unpopular politician or semi, you know, 41% or whatever approval rating, this is exactly what you want, which is you're not voting for me, you're voting against the other side, especially by tying it to abortion. I think very strategic choice there by the Biden administration. And I think there's a couple things that are, because I mean, it does sound to me, to my ears, very similar to rhetoric we've been hearing from Mm -hmm. Biden since, you know, it sounds like an echo to his 2020 campaign and the way that he ran that and the sort of themes that he ran on. So there was nothing to me shocking about that. The couple of things that are new that makes it hit a little bit different is number one, as you're pointing out, Sagar, now we have the overturning of Roe versus Wade. So that gets layered into making the case that Republicans are outside of the mainstream, that Republican elites and the elected officials and Trump are sort of, you know, on the extreme fringe. So that's sort of added into it. And I think does give the argument more heft because we are seeing, and we're going to cover this more in the midterms block, the way that women have been extraordinarily moved, and it really has shifted the ground, that decision. The other thing is, I mean, you know, last time Biden was running, we hadn't had Stop the Steal yet. We hadn't had January 6th yet. We hadn't had fake electors schemes yet um, and all of that part of our of our history now. So I do think that that sort of changes the context and the backdrop for it. But look, we know that uh, as much as I would love for them to be running on an affirmative vision, Democrats haven't told us what they would do um, if they win, uh, if they manage to keep control of the Senate, if they manage to add a couple seats and have a crack at doing something bigger than what they were able to do with Manchin and Cinema, by basically running the show. Republicans also haven't told us what they're going to do. So I do think that it's an effective argument. I think it's the argument that has led to Democrats having a shot at keeping control. But, um, you know, I, I found the, the like panic attack over it. I found it kind of amusing. And there were a lot of people who were like, oh, my God, the norms and the guardrails mm. who, on, you know, when it comes to Trump, they were like laughing at the pearl clutchers for the same thing. Let me just say this. Anybody who's <laughs> like, oh, my God, he used the military. You ever heard of the mission accomplished speech by George W. Bush? Like, I'm just going to say, like, these norms were shattered a long, long time ago. And this also just gets to are the norms being shattered right now or were they shattered already? And that's why Donald Trump got elected in the first place. I'm going to go with the latter. Now, Biden, his problem is he's like, I'm I'm the norms respecter whenever he just does what any president does, which is use the mantle of the Oval Office in order to promote your agenda and yourself politically. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but I did hear a lot of crocodile tears from the right, and everyone's like, oh, he looks like a dictator. Trump at his re-election rally on the South Lawn at the White House, okay? <laughs> like, I don't, and by the way, I was fine with it. I was like, what? And, and okay? Trump is right that now yeah. out there, like, they yeah. should just go ahead and install me as president. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like, exactly. Let's just toss out the election like, and just install me as president president. He said multiple times. The president gets to use the White House and all of the majesty of the Oval Office in order to run for re-election. Is it unfair? Yeah. Trump used to roll up with Air Force One, get off the plane, have Air Force One behind him, and do multiple rallies. Once again, that's how it goes, folks. I don't really want to hear complaints, especially whenever we all know Trump is just as flagrant of a norms violator. And maybe those norms are stupid and annoying and were always fake in the The, first place. The norms were never my issue. I have many issues with Donald Trump. That we've talked about here plenty of times, but the like, you know, all the pearl clutching about like, oh my gosh, the right. grills, yeah. the norms, how could you? The civility, where's okay. the civility? Okay, relax, yeah. everybody. That's right. Um, and this is the additional context uh, for this speech. Let's go ahead and put the latest polling for this. This is from the Wall Street Journal that just continues to show Democrats gaining ground. Um, you've got uh, A4, this is A4. Yeah. Um, Democrats gaining on the generic ballot for Congress, 47 44. You've got President Biden's job approval, disapproval rating at 45 still under underwater, but markedly improved Mm -hmm. from where he used to be. And then in the head-to-head, you've got Biden 50, Trump 44. Um, U.S. headed in the right direction, wrong direction, though, still a disaster. Only 23% say we are headed in the right direction. 68% say we are headed in the wrong direction. So the other thing that um, uh, Republicans, Fox News, et cetera, were trying to make a big deal of out of Biden's speech is even though In my opinion, he's gone out of his way to be like, I'm not talking about all Republicans. I'm just talking about MAGA Republicans and this extreme fringe and, you know, people who have tendency to violence. They really want to uh, seize on his comments to try to turn them into another sort of deplorable moment Mm -hmm. and make it like, oh, you're talking about every single Republican in the country. So Biden was asked about that by, I think it was uh, Peter Peter Ducey who asked him this. Let's take a listen to what he had to say. Anyone who calls for the use of violence fails to contend with violence when it's used, refuses to acknowledge that an election has been won, and 
system on changing the way in which the rules and count votes. That is a threat to democracy. Democracy. So he says there, I don't consider any Trump supporter a threat to democracy. I do have a problem with people who, you know, support violence. So getting a lot of questions on this. Again, this is the thing that um, a lot of uh, Fox News types are sort of seizing on to say, oh, he hates all of you. And he's saying you're all fringe and that every Republican. But and he does have to continue to make it clear that's not what he's saying, because they definitely want to make that case that like they just hate you and think you're evil and think you're extreme, et cetera, et cetera. But in my opinion, he made it pretty clear in the speech. That's not what he was Be- saying. Beyond even that, beyond the strategy, that's the smart thing to do. I mean, what you want to do, is, and I'm not saying it's moral. What I'm saying is that it's not like Republicans Republicans haven't said that a vote for any Democrat is a vote for radical left policy. That I've watched and lived through the last several of these campaigns. Being divisive is good for politics. I'm not saying it's good for the country. What you want is to rile up your base, get the people who are against whatever's happening, cast everybody who is even marginally connected to that movement as extreme, and then say a vote for me is the vote for normalcy. It's the candidacy and the tactic that has been used by both major parties for basically the last 25 years. It was used against George W. Bush, against against John, uh, John Kerry. It was used by W against the Al Gore campaign. Gore used it against W, 2008. That's exactly what the McCain campaign it, it went really against Obama. It really comes actually like, from the like Newt Gingrich playbook yeah, in so, the 90s. Yeah, it's like the he was really era. sort of like the pioneering figure in this right. and sent out the fa- a famous memo that said, describe your uh, opponents as anti-family, as, mm-hmm. anti-chi- as anti-American. So um, it really stems from those sorts of politics and I think does, again, illustrate just... You know, when as long as Trump is at the center of our politics, like he is going to be the central dividing yes. line. It is. Uh, it works very well for him within the Republican base. It doesn't work out particularly well for the Republican Party as a whole. We saw that in 2018. We saw it again in 2020 when they, you know, lost the White House. We saw it very much in those two Georgia Senate races where Democrats are then able by this narrow margin to gain control. Uh, and I think you see it now, where I have no doubt if. But Trump was not such a central figure to the election right now. Republicans would be in a better spot for the midterms. Again, Dobbs uh, and overturning of Roe versus Wade has also been a, a major part of shifting the ground towards Democrats. But I think Trump is further complicating the situation for the Republican Party right now. And y'all better get used to it because he is definitely not going anywhere. His candidates, by and large, won their primaries. They are at the forefront of the Republicans' efforts to take back both the House and the Senate. Um, and as we're about to get to in a moment, you know, he is now out on the stump campaigning for them. Yeah, I mean, look, 80% of the people who voted in the Republican Party to impeach Trump are now gone. They're either retired or got their asses kicked out of office. So you tell me who's in charge. And as long as he's at the forefront, As the Dems ran against Trump in 2018 and in 2020 and 2016 as deplorables, these people, you know, are with him extreme, why wouldn't you do it again? I'm not, you know, obviously it didn't work for Hillary, but it worked for Joe Biden. It worked in 2018. For the midterms, they have a decent hit rate. The problem is, is it guarantees pretty much a close election, more divisiveness. But this is always the thing. It's like, is Trump the cause? Is he the effect? I would say he's both, right? But the fact is, he's here. He's here to stay. And the way he gives a speech, I mean, look, we're about to talk about it, but it's not like you see anything all that different over on what's going on there. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream. 